right, so it's complete, right? War is over in Israel, um, in the land of Canaan. It's come to an end, and Joshua gives permission for the tribes of uh, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh to return to their homes, right? He gives them permission to return home with this great exhortation, this great commendation that tell them that they did a great job, that they um, did what they had set out to do and what they promised to do. And he tells them, you know, don't even just go home, but go home with riches, go home with livestock, go home with all these things, all the plunder that we have accumulated. Take it home with you. Right? So they head out um, to the east side of the Jordan, and uh, and they've possessed the land, and all is well, and they live happily ever after, right? Anybody who knows the Bible knows that ain't true, <laughs> you know? I think sometimes it would be nice if, if Bible accounts that we read ended like that. They live happily ever after, um, but they don't because life is messy. You know, we continue to make mistakes. The Israelites continue to make mistakes. They would never be finished completely with the mistakes that they were making. They would never not be messy. And I love that about God because God never gave up on Israel, no matter how messy they were, no matter how many times they were going to get it wrong. You know, um, they were never packaged up in a pretty little bow at the end of 30 minutes, you know, like a sitcom. Um, And I love that because it tells me that the reality of everyone this side of heaven is that life is messy. And God knows that. God doesn't expect us to be perfect. As a matter of fact, he knows that we can't be perfect. But he does call us to be faithful, right? Faithful is is the, it was the message that I continued to receive over and over again as I wrote this week's study and as I went over it this week. Um, It was that message of continuing to be faithful, even when things are hard, when even when things are easy, when you think things are over and done, it's it's a message to continue to be faithful. You know, I think that faithfulness is a learned quality. You know, there are things that I think that we're born with. I think um, we're born with the ability to love, right? I think of this new little tiny baby. If you, any of you you know have been moms, you know that when you when you have a baby, when you give birth to a baby. There's just a love there, love from you to them, but a love from them to you. They feel safe with their mommy, right? They hear your voice. They heard it for the last nine months, and then they feel your skin on their skin, and there's just a safety and a love there when they're um, when they're looking at you. It is born into us. It's innate, this ability to love. I think we're also born with the ability to experience joy, right? Again, I think about that little baby, maybe just a little bit older, maybe two or three months old baby, who's just hysterically laughing because their mommy is playing peekaboo with them or or playing, I bet your toes, you know, and they're having a complete giggle fit. And what more uh, pure joy can you see than a little tiny baby who's having a giggle fit because their mommy is playing with them or their daddy is playing with them, right? That's complete, pure joy. And I think we're born with that. But then there are things that I think we have to learn, right? Like patience, self-control, and faithfulness. I don't think I've ever seen a child who is innately patient. I don't know. I don't know if you've ever met a little one. I think that some of us can say that, you know, we're born with the easy, like, I have an easy child. I can't say that I have any easy children. Uh, God just did not bless me with that with that easy child, right? But um, but I've heard people say that, you know, oh, they're, they're so easy. This child is so easy. But easy doesn't equate to patient, right? Because kids want it now and now and now. And, and they're not going to wait. You know, even a little baby isn't going to wait to eat. They're not going to wait when they need their diaper changed. They're not going to wait for anything. They want it, and they want it now. Children aren't born with self-control, right? 
They want what they want, and they are not willing to say, that is not good for me right now. Right? That's not uh, um, an innate quality and faithfulness. I have to tell you this story. Um, when we were in Mexico this last week, uh, the family that we go and visit that coordinates all of our time there, Jeff and Leela, uh, have adopted this little girl, their daughter, Choo Choo. And Choo Choo is just the sweetest thing. And we've known her since she was a baby. Jeff and Leela have had her since they were, she was a baby. And now she's about three years old. Um, and everything that she sees that she likes is, I like that. Mine? It's mine. I like that. It's mine. So it didn't matter whether we were going to the coffee house or we were playing at home or at the children's home. Everything was, I like that. It's mine. So on Sunday morning, we were given the opportunity to, um, to take over the children's wing in their church and give those workers the day off. So we took over all their classes and taught the kids. And since it was my birthday that day, I decided that I would give myself a little joy and that I was going to work in the nursery. So I did. I, I worked in the nursery with Choo Choo and, and a couple of other kids. And there was these buckets of toys. And so we're playing. And every time I would go to pick up a toy, Choo Choo would say, I like that. It's mine. And I would say, okay. So I'd give her the toy. And then I'd pick up another toy to give to another child. And she would go immediately to that toy and say, I like that. It's mine. No, it's theirs. No, I like that. It's mine. And she'd take it. Right? And then I'd go for another toy, give it to the child. I like that. It's mine. Right? See, she didn't even have faithfulness to the toy that she liked at the moment. It was ready to be put aside the minute she liked something else. We are not born with faithfulness. And I think in our text this week, the tribes were... They were exhorted to be faithful by following the commands of the Lord. But I'm so grateful that in the New Testament, we're told that faithfulness is a fruit of the Spirit. It is not a, it is not a, um, a work, right? It is a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 and 23 tells us, in the New Living Translation, it says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Notice that the Scripture says that the Holy Spirit produces these things. It doesn't say that we produce these things. It says the Holy Spirit produces these fruits. And I was reminded recently as I was reading a book um, that I'm not called to produce my own fruit. That's not my job, right? Right? The tree is called to remain planted near the stream where it can receive water, where it can receive nourishment, and then out of that nourishment, the roots grow down deep, it becomes strong, and it produces fruit. I don't know about you, but I've never come across a tree that I have seen straining to produce fruit. I've never seen a tree going, come on, you got this. Let's do this. Come on. If you just push hard enough, that fruit will be there. Right? The tree does not need to do that. The fruit is a natural byproduct of a tree that is nourished and healthy. Psalm 1, 1 through 3 tells us, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. You know, I think think it's important that we know that we don't always produce fruit, right? Trees don't produce fruit year-round. There's a time when they're dormant. It's, there's a time where they're just being nourished. There's a time where their roots are growing down deep, where they're becoming stronger and better built, right? And then in its season, right, in the season, it produces its fruit. Faithfulness is a fruit, and it is produced by our time 
with the Holy Spirit. It is produced by the Holy Spirit. We remain in the Word, right? It says that His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law He meditates day and night. That is where our nourishment comes from. It it comes from the Word of God. That water, that stream that we are planted by, Jesus told us to abide in the vine, right? We stay close to Him and His Word and His commandments. And He nourishes us and gives us health in order that the Holy Spirit can then grow us strong and produce the fruit of faithfulness. He produces that in us. We don't produce it in ourselves. In reading this week, we find out that all the tribes on both sides of the river are, I think they're trying their best to be faithful. You know, neither one of them was trying to um, to disobey the word of the Lord. Neither one of them was trying to walk away from what he had for them. Right? They were both trying to be faithful. And those on the west side of the Jordan, you know, their re- initial reaction was, let's go to war. And I had to stop and think about that. I'm like, whoa, hold your horses there. Like, let's go to war. These are your brothers. You have just been fighting beside them all this time. Like, why jump to let's go to war? But they were still sort of in that mindset. And... And this was their flesh reaction. Also, I have to think that they saw food in their camp. What what they saw with the building of the altar was sin in their camp. And they had just been through that, right? They had been through that enough with Achan, right? They had been through that enough. We learned about Peor this week, right? They had been through that enough. They were not going to allow any more sin in their camp. This was an act of faithfulness. They were saying, Lord... We want to be faithful to you. And if we're, not being, if, if we're not being faithful, if our brethren are not being faithful, we're going to take action. We're going to take action right now. Right? So they immediately jumped to this initial reaction of let's go to war. But in their faithfulness, I think they were able to take a step back and to bring it before the Lord and then to instead choose a better path, which was to send out a delegation, right? They send out Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, and they send out the ten, um, the ten leaders, one from each tribe, in order to speak to the, to the two and a half tribes who built the altar. I think that was a better way to go about it. But they learn the importance of faithfulness to God, and I think that their heart even though they jumped first to let's go to war, were to honor the Lord, to be faithful in the commandments that he had given them. Likewise, the tribes on the east side of the Jordan, right, Gad and Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they testified that they didn't set up the altar for improper use, right? They, They knew the consequences of what would come if they were turning away from the Lord. And they didn't want that either. So the first thing they do is testify. And they say, you know, that's not our purpose. That was not our intent. Um, they didn't want uh, for, for their brethren to think that about them. And I think that this is why they invoked the name of the Lord so many times. You know, when they began their testimony, they invoked the name of the Lord twice, saying, the God of God, right? He knows. And I think that was their way of saying, God knows our heart. God knows why we made this. And, you know, I think that, this is just my personal opinion, but I think that if they had done that and they were lying, God would have struck them down, right? Look at Achan. God would have struck them down. How are you going to invoke the name of the Lord and lie? I think their hearts were to be faithful to the Lord. Their hearts were in the right place. And so they were able to give this testimony. They, their hearts were to honor the Lord, but, but we still have to, to think about the fact that their flesh chose land outside of the promise of God. Even though their hearts were faithful and their hearts were to honor the God, they chose land outside of God's promise, outside of his promised land. 
and he honored that request. He honored it for them. And I think that we all know people like this. I think that maybe we are people like this. I think at one point in time, I was a person like this, somebody who stands so close to the edge of God's promise without fully entering in. Somebody who says, I know that everything you have for me is right here, but I'm not ready for that. So I'm just going to stand right here. I'm going to be so close that I can be united. I'm going to be so close to that, to that um, I, can be, I can be a part of so that people will look at me and know that I'm a part of, but I'm not fully in God's promise. Right? Um, you know, the altar was their claim to God. It was their claim to the Israelites, and I think we do that. I think when we put our Christian bumper stickers sometimes on our car that say Jesus, or, or we're wearing the shirts, or we're, um, <clears throat> or we put it on our Facebook page that we are Christian, right? That's our little label that says, see, I belong with them. See, I, I'm with them. Even if we're not completely with them, but we can say, see, I'm, I'm close enough. I'm right there. The only thing that divides me is a raging river. Right? But, but I'm close enough. And I want you to know that. I want you to remember that. I want you to remember that I am a part of what, the, what they have going on right there. Even if I'm not, you know, completely a part of it. I am a part of it. And I think that we do that. I know that I did that. I think maybe, maybe we're afraid of, maybe, maybe Reuben and Gad and the tribe of Manasseh, maybe they were afraid of leaving behind everything they knew and entering into something that, that maybe was a little unstable. And maybe they didn't know everything God had in store for them. Maybe they didn't know all the blessings. And so maybe they were afraid to leave what they knew was good, right? The land there on, on that bank on the east side of the Jordan River, it was good for cattle, and they were cattle herders. They, they had their livestock, so it was good for them. And I think maybe, maybe we're like that. Maybe we think, well, life is good right now. You know, I have everything I want. I have a, a family and a good job and a place to live. You know, everything is good right here. So why do I need to go all the way in over there? Right? I can have the blessing of God right here on the edge. I don't need to be all the way in there because God will bless me here. And I'm happy here. And I like it here. And I'm comfortable here. And you know what God said to them? He said, that's okay. He didn't say, oh, you horrible children. I told you to be over. No, he said, that's okay. But let me tell you something. In this scripture this week that we read, the tribes, when they're testifying to um, Phineas, they say, well, God put a river in between us, and we didn't want for your children to think that we didn't belong because God put this river and divided us by this river. No, no, no. God did not divide them by the river. They divided themselves. They set themselves apart. They set themselves on the other side of the river. Now, it wasn't God's plan. God's plan was never to divide his children. God's plan was to bless them all in the same place so that they were protected. And they were safe. They had each other to lean on. They had each other to keep accountable Right? That wasn't God's plan to separate them and divide them by this river. They did that themselves. But God still blessed them. God still loved them. Right? Even on the other side of the river. God's heart was still for them. I think that these two and a half tribes that had every desire to be faithful to the Lord but their lack of commitment to God's plan chose them, had them erect an altar that wouldn't have even been necessary if they had chosen God's plan over their own. Because God made it clear, this is the promised land. And if they had chosen that, 
there wouldn't have been any need for an altar to remind the generation. There would not have been a need for an altar to say, we're a part of what you're doing. We have a part in your God. We are his children too. Had they chosen God's plan and not their own. I understand that it's hard to choose God's plan when it's not... um, when it is not completely laid out, when there are uncertainties. But God's plan is always the best plan. And they needed to take their rightful place in the promised land with their family. You know, Phineas even gave them that chance. Phineas said, come and be with us. Right? If your land isn't suitable, come and be with us. If you find yourself today in a place where you've elected to sit outside of the promised land, maybe you're just sitting on the border of it, and you're still receiving blessing, and you're still a part, and you're still united, but you're not fully in, right? You haven't chosen to fully step over. I want to exhort you the same way that Phineas exhorted them, right? He said, If you know that you're not where the Lord would have you, then come and dwell among us. Right? There's always room for you. God is never going to be full vacancy. He says that he went to prepare a place for you. That means here on earth, too, there is a place for you. He has prepared a place specifically for you. So come and join in. Step into the fullness of what God has for you in faith. Because that's where faithfulness begins, right? With faith. In faith, step out. And God is faithful. Even if we're not, even if we get it wrong, even if we keep messing it up, I pray the Lord that Israel can never mess up enough for God to give up. (laughs) He's not ever going to give up on us. We're never going to be so messed up that God is going to say, well, I made a mistake. You need to leave my land. Right? So I feel safe being fully engulfed in God's promises. Diving in head first to God's promised land. That's where I'm safest. That's where you're safest. So come and join me and dwell among us, ladies, and be faithful. Let's pray.